Okay, thank you for waiting. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to this session. Uh, my name is Iwao Hosako of uh, National Institute of Information and Communication Technology Japan, and uh, we organize this session, and uh, we'd like to start this session. Session name is Future Network System as Open Service Platform, the Beyond 5G, 6G Era. At the first uh, of this session, uh, we would like to, uh, uh, on behalf of our organizer, we would like to greet uh, greetings from the uh, NICT's Vice President, uh, Dr. Uh, Imaraki san Thank you, Chief Person. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm honored to be here as the host of today's panel discussion, uh, re representing the National Institute of Information and Communication Technology, NICT. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all of you, uh, and I'd like to have this opportunity to uh, engage in meaningful discussion on this important topic. We are taking advantage of this wonderful opportunity uh, of the in, uh, Internet Governance Forum, IGF, is being in Kyoto where we can reflect on the future of network systems, and I look forward to chartering uh, new directions. Our theme for today uh, is future network system as open service platform in beyond 5G, 6G era. This theme explores how information and communication services will evolve and create new values through open innovation. We have assembled a distinguished panel of experts from around the world to explore this critical topic in depth. And I believe that together we get to gain valuable insights. Today's discussion has the uh, potential not only to shape the future of communication system, but also to foster common understanding of information and communication policies and the research directions worldwide. NICT would like to play a leading uh, role in research and development for the realization of Beyond 5G and to enhance international coordination in this field. However, in order to achieve this important vision, uh, stakeholders worldwide need to share a common vision and work together. Therefore, in today's panel, uh, we aim to integrate the diverse perspective of Beyond 5G uh, experts from around the world as, uh, to deepen uh, our understanding and uh, foster collaborations. Uh, so let's start today's discussion. I look forward to hearing your valuable insight and opinions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for the very warm words from the uh, Dr. Ibaraki. And I would like to move the next step, and uh, I would like to hand over the mic to the Dr. Ishizu, who is uh, real, uh, really planning the, uh, this session and uh, who will uh, moderate the panel session. Okay, Ishizu-san, please. Uh, thank you very much, Hosako-san. So, uh, could you show, okay. Yes, the session is a uh, uh, future network system as open service platform in beyond 5G, 6G era. So uh, agenda is like this. Uh, to begin with, I would like to uh, introduce myself. My name is, is uh, Kentaro Ishizu. Uh, 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 I'm a director uh, of uh, Beyond 5G Design Initiative of NICT. And, uh, uh, my background is uh, wireless technology, uh, including uh, uh, spectrum sharing or cognitive radio, heterogeneous networking, uh, this kind of thing. And uh, 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 I'm honored to serve as a, a moderator of this important session uh, and looking forward to, uh, to uh, discussions on this uh, important topic with you. Okay, so uh, now I would like to go into the session. Uh, first, I would like to uh, explain, the, explain the motivation uh, of this session, and also I would like to 
uh, present uh, initial input on this topic. Okay, so and I'm, I'm now moving into the, uh, onto the uh, agenda item number two. Okay, motivation of this session. A uh, future networking system with beyond 5G 6G technologies are coming soon, and the system would be composed of combinations of uncountable subsystems brought from many stakeholders from not only ICT industry, but also across broad fields of industries. A uh, new platform would be necessary to deal with such complicated systems the platform might be based on an open concept so that small to medium-sized enterprises with cutting-edge uh, technologies uh, such as tier two or three uh, can uh, directly join the future ecosystem. So moreover, even uh, companies in developing countries could have opportunity and motivations to naturally and easily join the ecosystem. This is very important. So this session would like to focus on uh, feasibility of the new platform in the Beyond 5G 6G era. Not only advantages, but also uh, concerns or issues must be there, so we need discussions. Uh, discussions uh, are required based on experience and knowledge from various professional activities in different uh, regions. As you can see, uh, we have a distinguished panelist from different continents, so uh, I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Okay, so uh, I would like to uh, now uh, introduce the distinguished four panelists. Uh, first, uh, Mr. Uh, Tabisa uh, Faye. Okay, she is a counselor for Independent Communications Authority of South Africa. The second panelist is uh, Mr. Abhimanyu Kosain, a senior director at the Institute for Wireless Internet of Things, uh, Northeastern University, USA. The third uh, panelist is uh, Dr. Maria uh, Mat Matimiko Bru, a research director at University of Aul, Finland. The last uh, uh, panelist is uh, Professor Tony Quick, a professor at Singapore University of Technology and Design. Okay, so uh, first I would like to input some information and then uh, I would like to uh, ask for ask the uh, 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 panelists for a presentation. Okay, so NICT is uh, only national institute of R&D on ICT. We have around 700 researchers in ICT area. Uh, NICT uh, has uh, set Beyond 5G as uh, uh, one of interdepartmental uh, inter research areas. Uh, my input is about the vision and R&D activities of NICT, especially regarding concept and of, of open service platform. Okay, so uh, NICT has published Beyond 5G 6 white papers. The first version was published in uh, 2021, uh, uh, and the latest version is 23. Uh, we have the latest version was published in this uh, March. The Contents, is, contents are a result of a discussion with more than uh, 100 volunteering uh, researchers in NICT. The white paper starts with five scenarios of future life in 2030s, uh, then uh, by uh, 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 backcasting from the uh, scenarios, uh, we have extracted uh, and uh, categorized key technologies to uh, tackle uh, as uh, current R&D topics. Okay, so uh, there is a nice video. Uh, and <laughs> we have a nice video envisioning uh, actually the future life described in the white paper. Uh, so uh, I think it's better to show this video rather than explain by myself. So uh, please take a look. Uh, it takes like, just uh, two minutes. The technology of NICT will shape the future. Let us take a look at how NICT will play a part in our lives to come.
じゃあそろそろ演奏会始めますかああお待たせ先生もう遅いですよあごめんごめん今月でさ月いくらリモート技術が発展したからって月から指揮したらさすがにずれるんじゃそれがずれないんだな AI による予測のもと NTN と時空間同期を使えばねなるほどじゃあ行くよ<音楽>まず NTN は地上から宇宙までを3次元的につなぐ通信ネットワークそして時空間同期はサイバー空間とフィジカル空間の時刻と位置を同期させて協調動作を可能にするこれらがあれば場所を気にせず情報を共有しアバターを通じた新しいコミュニケーションも可能になるんだまたテラヘルツ波の活用を推進し超高速の次世代通信ネットワークを構築しているよScenarios and based on the scenarios,、uh, we, uh, have, uh, you, we extracted use cases.、Uh, each of the three scenarios has a number of use cases.、Uh, each use case summarizes the system to be used and their uh, details. Uh, details. Uh, each key technology、uh, summarizes a、uh, uh, technology to be used in the future、uh, and why it is needed,、uh, current status. And so on. This is how the white paper is organized. And、uh, now I would like to really briefly introduce the scenarios of the、uh, white paper. Scenario one is organized as a diary of a director working in a manufacturing company.、Uh, in this、uh, scenario, people jack in、uh, remotely onto cybernetic avatars or human type、uh, robots, and then、uh, Next one, scenario two, is focusing on、uh, working style when people、uh, go to the moon and uh, conduct uh, uh, underground、uh, material survey and so on. So, on the、uh, moon,、uh, we send to the moon, we send avatars and then、uh, we、uh, control remotely、uh, so that we can work from the moon,、uh, from the earth. The third one is uh, regarding uh, uh, our activities area, and we are extending our、uh, activi active area from the ground to the 3D area. And、uh, we are going to use drones more actively,、uh, sky cars or sky trucks, and so on. So many things are going flying. And If we think about the future, we also need to highlight the a shadow part of the future.、Uh, the message is、uh, this is a message that Beyond 5G has such perspective, not perfect,、uh, as we show in the scenario one, two, three. We would like to、uh, extend our discussion to uh, uh, ethical, legal, and social issues, so called LC. Uh, in addition to、uh, technical RD activities. The scenario five, last one, focuses on、uh, more into details of human life. We work,、uh, new working style is going to be changed uh, by uh, using uh, uh, perfect research、uh, resource matching、uh, by cross industry orchestration with AI. 
Uh, those are scenarios, and the, maybe you think this is really fantasy, but actually these are not fantasy. We uh, uh, have some evidence, and uh, based on the evidence, we imagine the future, and that's how we have those uh, scenarios. Uh, okay, uh, these are key technologies for Beyond 5G. We have extracted from the scenarios, and T1 to 3 are close to radio access and networking technologies. T4 are, is a non-terrestrial network, so-called NTN technologies. T5 is a, cut, uh, is a uh, technology for uh, space-time synchronization. We need a precise uh, location and time to enhance the uh, application and uh, communication. And T6, uh, deal with security and reliability. T7 is regarding innovative application. And as such, uh, the technologies are so distributed for Beyond 5G. This implies that uh, systems are going to be increased and not very easy to be composed as one system, one box. So that's how we need the following discussions. Okay, uh, this is uh, another important concept of Beyond 5G, a cyber physical system, or CPS. Uh, physical space is the real world where, uh, where uh, human beings are really uh, living, and cyberspace is the emulated world uh, realized on computers. Uh, in the physical space, uh, there are so many uh, communication systems and application systems are there, such as uh, non-terrestrial networking system like satellites or uh, airplanes. And also on the ground, there are uh, new wireless systems, for example, using terahertz band. And such uh, systems will, be, uh, will appear. Uh, then uh, sensing data uh, is uh, sent from the physical space to cyberspace and then uh, uh, in the cyberspace, the data is accumulated, analyzed, and the future will be uh, predicted. Then uh, the cyberspace actuates the physical space for uh, optimization. And the important thing is the circulation of the cycle. Uh, the one cycle is not, maybe it's already uh, realized, and the circulation of the sensing and actuation is important, and it is uh, realized by, um, not by human, by, but by machine. Okay, so, and who creates the Beyond 5G system? Uh, it is too complicated for a single organization to build up a whole system by itself. It is still, it is already difficult uh, now, but in the future, it is much more complicated. So it's already, it's uh, completely difficult for one organization to uh, realize the system. So uh, different organizations, including uh, operators, providers, and individuals need to bring their own subsystem, and somehow we need to uh, uh, combine the systems. This is the important uh, concept, and uh, this is the, I think, most important slide in my presentation, uh, concept of uh, cross-industry orchestration. As you can see, in the left-hand side, there is a mobile operators. Uh, there are mobile mo operators, and in the future, to enhance the spectrum frequency, spectrum sharing efficiency, for example, or to uh, realize new applications, we need they need to uh, collaborate each other. And also, if you look uh, horizontally, uh, another industry, like uh, hubs or satellite communication or metaverse, digital thing as you can see, or maybe it's not shown, but uh, for example, drone control system or uh, traffic management system, or maybe or another systems in, uh, for example, uh, medical system or other things, I don't know, maybe smart cities. 
another industry also need to uh, collaborate with each other. So that's, how, that's why we have orchestrated in the, in the upper part. And by this, uh, there might be an opportunity for everyone, including small, middle uh, enterprises, to join this world. And uh, optimized, com optimized combinations of subsystems can be found by algorithm maybe in the orchestrator. The orchestrator may use some AI algorithm. Uh, the more systems are connected, there might there will be the more service combination will be. So uh, that's how that's why uh, the concept is very very important for the future. Okay, and uh, beyond five H architecture for open service framework is now under consideration in NICT. Also, we break down the concept and really uh, designing the. Uh, functions and interfaces uh, of uh, those functions. Uh, you can see the orchestrator is, uh, as I explained, but also you can see the service enabler. Uh, users, from users, it is very difficult to understand the, uh, everything about the cyber physical system because there are so many uh, complicated systems so it is hard for users to understand the systems, subsystems. So there is a, some function, we call it service enabler. And service enabler receives the uh, request from users and uh, communicate with orchestrator to realize that, uh, to uh, meet the requirement from users. And anyway, we are now investigating the details of them and uh, designing proof of concept system to be, uh, discuss with uh, many stakeholders. Okay, uh, this is my presentation. Now, I would like to ask uh, position talks from the panelist, from panelist closer to me. Uh, okay, so I will switch to the presentation. Okay, then uh, Tabisa-san, could you start your talk? Okay. All right, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, very late afternoon to everyone in the room. Uh, my name is Tabi Safai Mwangi. I am from ECASA, which is the ICT regulator in South Africa. I um, serve as a counselor there. Um, this afternoon, I'll just briefly give you the regulator's perspective, but also the African perspective. Um, on where we are with regards to beyond 5G. And I think we provide a very different um, perspective uh, in terms of our readiness, our participation, as well as the challenges that we see um, would impact the developing nations. So just a brief introduction um, around myself. Uh, like I said, I'm a counselor at the Regulatory Authority in South Africa. I have an extensive professional background in management consulting prior to joining the regulator last year in December. Uh, my areas of interest are in ICT um, and, and uh, renewable energies and their social economic impact on the current context and the future that we're all trying to shape and influence. I have working knowledge in 18 African countries in the sub-Saharan region. Um, but I do have exposure to a lot more. So I, I think I can um, firmly say that I do speak for the African, or at least the sub-Saharan African context. Next. All right, I just wanna quickly touch on, you know, future networks beyond uh, 5G. And really for developing nations, and I'd say the developing African nations, um, this is an inevitable reality, but 
when we get to participate and how we participate is really what is under debate. Um, so we know that future networks have the potential to unlock immense development and growth for developing nations. South Africa is no exception to this. While increasingly more African countries have access to 5G spectrum, with South Africa uh, coming to the market during COVID uh, through temporary spectrum assignment, and more recently licensing um, through an auction in March 2022. The cost of rolling out 5G, however, is what has really hamstrung um, the true impact or realizing the true impact um, of 5G in, in South Africa. The second uh, challenge that has been seen is more around the infrastructure, the, the supporting infrastructure that is required for this to be realized. And this is mainly around electricity and the current electricity crisis that we're having. As much as we want to leave no one behind, the economic feasibility of rolling out across the nation is one that is rather distant at the moment. The energy costs in the country, it, the energy costs in a country that is battling with a national energy crisis and rolling blackouts, and the energy consumption and consistency that's required to sustain these kind of networks is something that is not yet feasible in South Africa. But it's not so distant, and it's not something we have not tried to despite all the odds. Um, this doesn't stop us, like I say, from participating. We continue to shape and share the African insights, and future networks stand to have a great impact on agriculture, which remains to be a, gr a big contributor towards um, a, a lot of the GDPs in, in African countries. Um, and I think as I go through, through the slide, I'd also, at the end of the slide, I'll just share a bit of what we envision it looking like, or rather what I personally envision it looking like. So unlocking the value chain of agriculture and all vertically integrated industries would exponentially increase the economic value of agriculture. One of those vertically integrated industries is banking and finance, including and bringing into the circle more economic participants and active participants at that, which continue to be increasingly powered by ICT innovation. And then we also, um, look at safety and security on future networks, which will determine user uptake and user base. And lastly, I spoke about the electricity crisis just now, and this is what really is one of the greatest impacts around um, us getting towards beyond 5G. Uh, earlier this year at the, the 5G huddle that was hosted in, in Singapore, um, we spoke quite extensively around the energy constraints and, and the difficulties um, in, in rolling out and how we cannot really move to 6G if we haven't solved for the energy um, um, demands of, of these networks. And in doing so, if we want to do that, if we push ahead with 6G in its current prototypes or, or uh, pilot forms, we risk leaving behind the developing African nations. Um, I think before I go into the slide of just um, explaining the African context, I want to paint a picture of what um, future networks could do for an African um, individual or a South African individual. Um, my father lives in rural South Africa. He refuses to move to the city. He works there and he still lives in his, in his um, rural home. Um, but one of my father's things that he does is he's a farmer of sheep. He has more than 200 sheep. And every year he needs to shear those sheep and sell the wool. It's his you know, subsidiary income to being able to grow his livestock. Um, but once he's sheared those sheep, he then needs to load the wool into a truck. And then there are four cooperatives all around uh, 200 or or so kilometers away from his house, all of which he needs to travel to to get an assessment of his wool and then get a price, and then he will sell to the best um, offer. Now imagine if he could shear his sheep, or even before he shears his sheep, drones could come and take samples of the wool, take them back to the cooperatives, or do the analysis, and then be able to then give him the price before he goes out and has to travel 600 kilometers round trip um, on a single day. So that for us is 
oh, that for me is how I envision the impact of future uh, networks in, the, in an African context. It would increase my, my, my father's um, economic participation immensely. It would decrease his costs. It would save him time. And it would allow him to grow his livestock um, to an even greater number and contribute. And secondly, it would then also then stimulate the subsidiary um, industries, the vertically in the, um, integrated industries, the agro-processing, the textile industry, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to quickly go through the African context. Um, and really what this is, is around what are the greatest impacts for us. And I've just highlighted um, a few impacts, six impacts there. The first is the economic growth and the economic participation by um, you know, increasing the buying power and accelerating the economic participation of all. Uh, secondly is infrastructure development, um, being able to maintain and, and expand uh, essential infrastructure for, for, to sustain these networks. Um, and then digital inclusion, this is so important and really it's the one thing that underpins um, anything that we do in, in terms of, of future networks. Um, it, is the, it is the fundamental development imperative. Uh, secondly, collaboration and shared resources. We cannot do this on our own strength. Um, and it, it's not just about collaboration in government, but it's collaboration in the private sector. So the, the, the big uh, private players um, taking on and creating space for the small medium enterprises, as well as you know the, the regulator being more open and transparent in how we do things to allow a greater participation with industry, um, having a light touch approach to how we regulate, um, and, and sharing and leveraging of resources such as uh, research and development. And then being an innovation enabler, being creating a conducive environment um, for innovation to thrive. And that comes from policy and regulation and how we shape and position ourselves. And then lastly, around sustainability, creating shared value um, for future generations to come. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Um, here I've just highlighted some of the challenges that we see, and I think I've spoken to some of these in my earlier slides. Um, the first is affordability, the cost um, of, of rolling out these uh, future networks and establishing them. Um, where when you come from a country with so many competing interests, um, you know, when you're talking about what we term uh, in South Africa stomach politics, it's poverty, unemployment, and, and you know, just having basic um, essentials. You know, this, the affordability and the cost factor becomes a huge hindrance for us. Um, and then security and privacy, so ensuring that um, we're not only just, um, you know, building these networks in, in a, with a secure by design framework, but also um, ensuring that we understand how the open systems work, that we understand how we, we are going to regulate the open systems, and we position the regulator and the policy makers to be able to, to stand in that gap and, and provide that, that assurance. Um, the regulatory frameworks, the agility of, of regulatory is something that is slowly coming into the African context. Um, and so we're hoping that with the introduction of that agility, it would change a lot of the regulatory frameworks and how we choose to regulate. And then lastly, infrastructure de deployment, which I think I've spoken extensively to. Um, so open system platforms, um, I think for me, I just picked four of what I think would be the biggest advantages um, to, to these platforms. The first is interoperability, especially when you're talking about spectrum and it being such a scarce resource. Um, so the ability to share the spectrum, a lot of countries, mine included, we do not support spectrum sharing um, or spectrum trading. And that becomes a massive legal issue. Uh, it is about protecting the value of the asset and, and, and uh, giving the regulator the power to still have um, control over the, the radio frequency planning. However, you know, there are ways to get around it um, and, and ways to think about it to promote economic viability, etc. Um, the second is, is about scalability and flexibility, so being able to scale 
at our own pace, being able to, uh, to, to adopt things that are um, within the context that they're going to be used in. Um, and then around the ecosystem growth, I spoke earlier about collaboration and I'll close off just now um, around collaboration and, and having that vibrant ecosystem that creates a space for small, medium enterprises. And then lastly, around security and privacy. The promotion of security by design, you know, to reduce the regulatory framework expectations and limit the instances of reactive regulatory um, um, uh, instead of proactive. The use of, of agile and innovative regulatory tools, and I'll speak in my next slide about that. Um, and in South Africa, you know, we do have that legislation around privacy and protection of data, but what we haven't quite wrapped our heads around is how we're going to regulate the, the systems, the data systems um, that, that, that um, are, are going to be you know, running or fueling beyond 5G uh, networks. Uh, next slide. And then in my last slide, um, I just touched a bit about uh, cross-sectoral collaboration. And really, I think this is so important for developing nations, especially um, in, in the African context. So there are some regulatory considerations that need to be um, um, put to, to mind. And um, how do we create that agility? How do we make ourselves relevant? We don't necessarily have the budget for a full-scale R&D. Um, and, and so what do we do with what we have, considering the competing interests? And so sandboxes come to mind, you know, trying to start using regulatory sandboxes, inviting the private sector to, to do their tests and, 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 and run the, the regulatory compliance in those sandboxes. And for us to then feed off the, the research and the development that comes out of that, it's, it's a quick win in terms of R&D when you don't have the budget. And then um, digital transformation, and really this is around the localization of data. So ensuring that we have African solutions um, for the African context. Um, the monetization of, of, of models, um, and, and this is around diverse revenue streams and shared revenue models, um, being able to have a transparent uh, framework around that. Um, market competition, I think one of the greatest things when it comes, when you want to have trans, uh, transparency is um, the, uh, we have a competition regulator and the competition regulator immediately thinks collusion, collusion. And that's not always the, the, the case. So having healthy market competition, um, which breeds innovation. And then lastly, uh, global connectivity. We really cannot do this within our own strength. I've spoken about the competing interests that are um, that are the center of a lot of African countries. So being able to tap into international um, research and international value chains to leverage the research that we are doing um, and to power how we move forward is very important for us. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, next move on to Kosain san <coughs> Okay, now it's... I make it full screen. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. I would like to add my welcome uh, to, to this panel session and thank you for being here. Appreciate the invite uh, to NICT and, and, and the other sponsors. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm uh, Abhimanyu Gosain uh, from uh, Northeastern University out in Boston, Massachusetts from the USA. Uh, just a quick introduction of myself and the perspectives I bring uh, to this panel discussion. And just a quick disclaimer, I don't, um, all the views and opinions here are my own personal ones, so please don't attribute those to any of the agencies that you see listed here. Uh, so primarily I work uh, with the National Science Foundation on applied research projects uh, for building future uh, uh, platforms for 5G, 6G. Uh, there's a flagship project called uh, Power Platforms for Advanced Wireless Research, which was a public-private partnership that I'm going to get into a little bit, but primarily this was the foray for the Science Foundation and about 35 uh, industry member companies, global industry member companies, to define and shape the vision of 5G. So I'll talk about some of the lessons that we've learned and how they could be applied to the 6G era. Uh, I'm also involved with the U.S. Department of Defense in their 5G Future G program as a senior advisor where we are shaping how does the U.S. military 
um, the, the services adopt uh, commercial technologies and dual use technologies that could also be adapted uh, for a military construct. And then lastly, uh, work with the US Federal Communications Commission on their 60 uh, Technology Advisory Council as, as a co-chair and then a few various other board appointments. So the, the idea is to bring you a 360 degree view of what's happening at technology policy and governance. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> So a uh, quick word about uh, uh, to know and understand where we are going, we need to always reflect from the past. And this is a program uh, that we've been working on now, uh, coming up in seven years, where we set up a public-private partnership uh, to develop an open programmable research platform to help shape the vision of 5G. So this was a program that was founded up uh, in 2017. If you um, uh, bring the clock back, that was around the time that 5G standardization had already occurred. Uh, the standards were in place, but the implementation prototypes, proof of concepts weren't still there. And if you actually even look today, uh, in 2023, um, global adoption of a 5G standalone architecture is still something that the mobile network operators are, are working on. And again, I really appreciate the African context where that is still uh, something that needs to be done. But uh, the idea was, and again, the dollar figures are quite uh, nominal, um, um, you know, just uh, that's the first lesson that we learned, that it will require a, a lot more investment to bring together multiple different stakeholders from industry, academia, uh, as well as from the communities that we intend uh, to serve. Get a little bit more technical, next slide, please. Uh, we funded four research platforms across the US, and uh, we're also proud to say that the blueprints, and these are the words that I'll, I'll, I'll say a lot in the time that's remaining, uh, the blueprints, the reference architectures that we've been able to develop, design, implement, uh, have been adopted by our partner uh, uh, research groups and partner public-private partnerships across the globe. So in, in, in Europe, in, in Japan, in Korea, in uh, Brazil, we've been able to work uh, with a very open mindset, the ability to share how we are building a modular softwareized infrastructure architecture that allows for accelerated research adoption and the ability to onboard and build on ramps for stakeholders who don't necessarily care about the network or the communication. So we saw from the introductory slides a future platform that we're gonna talk about where you're gonna have multiple industries who frankly don't care about what network they use. For them, it's, it could just be Wi-Fi. The ability for them to move data from point A to point B in a timely, secure, resilient manner is all they care about. Wherever they get that, they're gonna go there. And our job here is to develop and push the agenda for uh, mobile network communication standards like 5G and 6G to be the choice uh, there. So these four platforms are across various technology and application use case areas. Um, uh, starting from uh, the left, uh, the platform out in University of Utah is primarily focused on uh, core underlying software technologies and radio technologies like um, Massive MIMO, which allows for a large number of scaling of antennas that allows you to serve a very diverse region uh, very effectively from uh, uh, a single uh, antenna system. The other one, Cosmos in New York City is mostly focused on smart communities. So this is deployed in downtown Manhattan, a very, very busy, highly dense area. So we've been focusing a lot on millimeter waves and optical communication. Um, and how does that connect back up to uh, smart communities and smart intersections, for example. The third one is focused on uh, UAS. So I really appreciated your sort of uh, future vision of drones flying out for farms. Um, and that actually uh, is conducting a lot of research and onboarding uh, non-traditional industry partners that are using the UAS. And we're also connecting the UAS mobility patterns with the communication technology. So building an entire UAS uh, um, unmanned aerial system that is fully outfitted with uh, a, a 5G radio, and that is a system that can then uh, be deployed for various uh, uh, use cases, be it agriculture, be it transport, be it, be it delivery, um, or even uh, for communication for fixed uh, 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 backhaul and integrated access and backhaul. Last but not the least, and this sort of resonates uh, quite closely with me as well, is around rural broadband digital inclusion. So this is the last pla uh, test platform out in Ames, Iowa, which is in the middle of the, the US, uh, very heavily dominated by, by farmland. And the, uh, the spirit of this particular test bed was to develop a farm as an anchor, which was the ability to outfit uh, uh, connectivity across multiple hundreds of miles using XHAL technology. So we are focused on uh, uh, free space optical communication, microwave 
uh, backhaul technologies. And the underlying theme for all four of them is an open modular architecture that we have uh, developed. Uh, underneath that, there is an asset that we've also inherited and developed uh, called Coliseum, which is a large-scale channel and network emulator. And this, I would um, you know, um, encourage you to view this as a digital twin. The idea that the cyber-physical systems exist, this is the version where the physical systems that you see uh, that have been deployed in geographically diverse contexts are now taken into the virtual world. So this is a network emulator that allows us to build digital versions, uh, digital versions of the channel, digital versions of the network, digital versions of the physical locations, and then be able to uh, do early prototyping, uh, validation, testing, modeling, in the emulated environment and then uh, as a closed loop feedback, bring that uh, learning back into the physical environment. So this is sort of helping us close that um, uh, divide. Next slide, please. So uh, this is again, now th this slide is primarily more uh, from, the, from, the uh, from the policy side and this is uh, the, the motivation that the USDOD, which is a huge juggernaut and frankly speaking a very large customer for com uh, commercial adoption of uh, uh, beyond 5G kind of technologies. And the idea here is to leverage the billions of dollars that are being invested and will continue to be invested in developing uh, telecommunication standards. So the idea is how does uh, the USDOD, and this is not, I, I want to be very clear, this is not with a warfighter mentality, this is primarily looking at DOD as an enterprise. Uh, because they have multiple application use cases and they fit very nicely into the, um, into the vision that uh, was presented by NICT earlier where uh, DOD is a logistics customer. They need to move uh, trucks from point A to point B in a timely manner. Um, they uh, want to use AR, VR, and XR for training purposes. So view that, uh, view that as a context that uh, the US DOD is trying to adopt uh, the vision for 5G and that has happened by, uh, by installation at 14 U.S. Army bases that are located in the continental United States where um, experimentation with 5G technologies is ongoing. And then there is a separate office for Future G which is trying to understand how does the DOD requirements get inserted in the standardization uh, uh, framework. And I think that will also be important when we talk about a future test platform because that has to be the springboard from which standardization takes place because that is a common platform platform where data, test, results are produced, validated, and can be mutually agreed upon when you move into the standardization phase as we will do uh, for 6G in about uh, two to three years, which is when the technical performance requirements of IMT 2030 are going to take place. Next slide, please. So this is the two by two about um, uh, for future G systems. So we talked about uh, different industries. So we are here looking at uh, uh, different kind of use cases that uh, we feel will be motivated. And again, as you see uh, on the on the x axis, you're looking at enterprise and mobility. So the extreme mobility use cases are to the right. More fixed uh, on the enterprise side are on on the left. And then uh, you also are moving from. Um, the, the equipment, which is the physical infrastructure, up to more of the, the extreme environments and the softwareization uh, elements that will need to be considered. So this is sort of uh, kind of my distillation of the earlier slide that was presented by NICT, which showed sort of the stovepiped uh, different kind of industry uh, mappings. Next slide, please. So um, again, I think the world is programmable, the world is virtual, um, the architectures are also moving in that direction. 5G has shown us uh, the deployment of 5G, the deployment of virtualized uh, and programmable networks, and we're gonna hear a lot about open radio access networks and what that brings to the table. Uh, this is sort of just our um, uh, kind of an academic version of how different modular elements in an entire network uh, system, and just to spell it out for everybody, um, you know, starting from from the device to uh, the, the edge, and the edge could be mobile itself. Um, it could also be uh, stationary or there could be a point cloud at the edge. Then you move into the, the, the core network, uh, and then you move into the wide area system where different cores could also be uh, interconnected. And the idea here is both horizontally and vertically on the protocol stack, we need uh, open interfaces where you now have the ability to insert, uh, depending on what quality of service, quality of experience you're trying to reach, uh, build a bespoke network 
uh, for every individual. The analogy is that 5G today is building a interstate highway for every consumer, which is not sustainable. Now, with 6G, we have to be much more adaptive, and all of this is going to um, distill back down to the energy uh, point uh, that Tabisa was uh, making, which resonates very clearly with us, because energy efficiency is going to be important, uh, not over-provisioning our networks, um, and then having intelligence built into all the four different elements uh, I talked about, from the edge to the transport network uh, to uh, uh, the, the core network and to the wide area network. Next slide, please. Uh, so these are. Th this is just a, a, a um, you know, a, a kind of notional view. Uh, this is where sort of the academic and the industry worlds are sort of merging in uh, from the top down. And the top is the orchestration piece. Uh, you see multiple different interfaces uh, southbound to the infrastructure and to the different network elements that will need to be uh, controlled. So you're going to need to have lifecycle management, you're going to need to have continuous integration and development, as well as uh, the concept of network slicing, which is going to continue, in my opinion, into the era of 6G, which is bespoke, customized network experience and building uh, the underlying infrastructure and the different network functions that are required to meet uh, whatever needs are going to be. Next slide, please. So uh, w one just uh, you know last uh, couple minutes that I have a, a kind of a plea to those who are building uh, platforms and sort of our perspective at least on the U.S. side is uh, l looking for a uniform platform for kind of ad uh, for automation and this has to be key because AI is going to be inserted at each uh, stage and the idea of being fully automated. Um, across the infrastructure, across the network functions that run on the infrastructure, and then the workloads that run on those network functions. And those all need to be automated and they need to be adapted uh, to meet the user requirement that's uh, uh, present there. So in addition to that, you're also going to uh, uh, have to think about the capacity, you're going to have to think about the latency, you're going to have to think about sort of the KPIs uh, that are going to be important for these future platforms uh, as we sort of build uh, uh, the, the test prototypes over the next 24 months. Next slide, please. So, okay, so this is uh, kind of, again, coming back and shining a light on the orchestrator as, again, uh, you know, we, in this panel, we're, we're, we're focused on. The idea here is, from the industry perspective to attract them to have this kind of a global um, 10,000 foot view where different industries can mix and match uh, together. You can develop different service combinations. The availability is a parameter that's going to be very, very important. The network needs to be uh, available when you need it for the bits to go from point A to point B. Um, then there has to be resilience in that network, and that will only happen if there is automation and resource optimization, which also touches on the energy, uh, eff uh, energy efficiency, energy consumption point, and the intelligence is very, very important. Uh, security, privacy, the ability to um, um, trust uh, the data that was inserted at the source and to make sure that it's the same data that comes out on the, um, uh, at the destination and how are you going to make sure that it wasn't snooped on, it wasn't eavesdropped, and you were able to operate through securely through this uh, commercial uh, uh, network. And industry is gonna be very, very um, astute and keen to make sure that the data that lives on their enterprise or on their cloud is not manipulated at all. Um, again, trustworthiness of the AI models that we use for each of those infrastructures is going to be very, very key. And then the open and interoperable standards uh, that are going to define uh, the next generation of uh, future networks. So with that, I'll uh, stop here. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much, Gosain-san. Uh, okay. Then uh, a second. Mm. Next, Maria San. Uh, okay, I think this is. Great, Maria thank San, you. Please. Thank you. My name is Maria Matin Mikka Blue, and I come from the University of Oulu in Finland. And there I hold a research director position in Infotech Oulu Focus Institute, and I'm also director of sustainability and regulation in our 6G flagship research program. That, is the, that was the world's first 6G research program globally, started in 2018. Next slide, please. So we started this research already 
five years ago. And from the very beginning, we took a multidisciplinary approach, combining technical research together with research on business and also regulations, including contributions to regulation. And this needs to be in multi-stakeholder collaboration. So industry has always been part of our, our research. You need to do it together to know the requirements, to know the technology developments, and really do clo close collaboration with the different companies, as well as the public sector, including the the regulator. And as an example of, of what we've done is we've been globally participating in the global 60 definition process at the ITUR called IMT 2030. I don't have those figures yet in this presentation because they are not agreed. They were supposed to be agreed last week, but that didn't happen, so they are not, not here. But I want to give you an example of a success story from before. So you know local 5G network, you know private 5G networks. We were talking about them and developing them already in the year 2016 and presenting this idea that 5G spectrum awarding should not only be to the big MNOs, mobile network operators, but also local licensing should be done. And everybody was criticizing this, but now it is a reality. So it's an example of industry, academia, regulator collaboration, which was then pushed through different forums of, of both research industry and regulatory forums. Next slide. So, so we did this world's first 60 white paper already four years ago, in September 2019, as a collaborative effort with 100, almost 100 people, including Japan and many other countries, industry, academia, some regulators were involved, and it, you can download it in the internet. And one of the key things there was that 60 is not only about the communication, transferring of bits, it brings together different capabilities, including sensing, locationing, positioning, and all those things, computing, and so on. And that creates a platform which is capable to realize new services that we don't even know today. So there will be a lot of different capabilities brought together by the network, by the devices. The network can sense the environment. It can create very accurate picture of the surrounding environment in real time, capturing also the changes there. Next slide. This is, this is also from that same, same white paper. We had a section about the business ecosystem, and, and it's an example of this, this multidisciplinary research, which, which, which is my favorite. So I, we, we, we see the world in such a way that it, it comes from different resource combinations, as we heard previously. So different companies, organizations, individuals, they provide resources to the table. Different users, user group, end users, machines, consumers, public sector companies, they have different needs for the, for the services. They are often location specific, like this conference center has a substantial Wi-Fi network to cater the data in here, for example. Locations, different locations like ports, harbors, traffic hubs, hospitals, they have their very specific needs. And the, today they are still tradition, like, like catered with traditional methods, but more and more location-specific needs emerge and also solutions to serve those needs are, are, are coming up. They involve different stakeholders. They involve different company combinations to serve those very different needs. The same network can then, then serve different user group with different service level requirements and so on. And we already see the changing business ecosystem. So these new business ecosystems emerge around these different usages in the different locations. We're already seeing the changes in what, what companies are doing with these local 5G networks, which mo most of the time are private, private networks serving a closed user group. But they also could be open, open public networks locally that then serve different customers, for example, MNOs customers and, and so on. So all these different combinations are are, are possible, they are in different regulatory domains. So there's a lot of regulatory <laughs> burden here, but it, it's very different in the different countries. But, but I'll, I'll skip that for, for, for this part. <coughs> Next slide. So the emergence of this large number of local 60 networks is kind of a natural step from what we see today. So we believe that this will happen. 
It's not just the mobile network operators who can deploy 5G networks today. For example, Japan, Finland, Germany, US, many countries have made it possible for different stakeholders to apply for a radio permit to operate their own network. It was, not, it was very rare in 4G era. Very few countries did that in the 4G era, but that is now, now happening without direct MNO involvement, but MNOs do it too. So there are many different ways to realize these networks, but the divergence between the countries is huge. So the spectrum is the, is the key there. And if, if, for example, in Europe, what you, where you can now deploy a private 5G network is very country specific, different in Finland compared to Germany, but they are studying a, 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 a common band from 3.8 to 4.2 gigahertz today, so that it would be some, some level of harmonization. And how to realize this? A large number of 6G networks, the access to spectrum is the bottleneck. It's based on sharing. It's based on sharing between the local networks, but also most likely between sharing of, of sharing between the local networks and the existing users of the spectrum. We know that spectrum is allocated to a variety of services. Finding clean, or clean spectrum or cleaning the bands is really, really challenging. It's, it, that's very challenging for 6G. So gaining access to spectrum through, local, through shared access for local networks is definitely something that will happen happen in the future. There are some papers that we did several years ago on, on this topic. Then the next slide. Then going to the sustainability and sustainable development. So we have, we know that the UNS, UNSDG framework is there. Our nations are committed to achieving that. It looks quite challenging. And if you look at it from the ICT perspective, seven out of the, seven out of the indicators from the 230 indicators are ICT specific, capturing things like percentage of schools with internet access. So they are not really the design criteria for 6G alone. Of course, they are what, what's the minimum that needs to be met. But for 6G, we need to understand sustainable development from this triple bottom line of economic, social, and environmental perspectives. And that's what the community is now starting to do or trying to do. But it's, it's, it's quite challenging because these perspectives are not so well known in our field, ICT field, and they're very much interrelated. You can solve environmental, social sustainability challenges if you had all the money in the world, but mobile communication is not, unfortunately, it's not charity, it's, it's business. So it all depends on the money and the investment in the networks and, and the services. The next slide. So in the first white paper from 2019, that was done in a global collaboration, one of the conclusions was that 6G should be driven by sustainability, uh, for example, by the UN SDGs. And then we did a follow-up paper, I coordinated that white paper that was published six, three years ago about connecting 6G with the UN SDGs. You can download both of these white papers f from online. And we know this, this is from four and three years ago, but the reality is still not there. The community is still not doing, doing that. We, we have energy efficiency. That is one indicator. That's one environmental sustainability related indicator. Even if you improve energy efficiency, but if the total consumption still increases, it's not enough. So when you talk about energy, you always have to have two indicators, at least two indicators, energy efficiency and energy consumption. Then the total energy consumption. It's not just the bits and pieces, but what is the total energy consumption? And then optimize the operations, the whole network design, so that we minimize this use of resources. Next slide. So this, this ICT sector's dual role in sustainable development is something that we have to keep in mind all the time. So we can, yes, we can enable a lot of great things in, in the different sectors of society through making their operations more efficient in an economically feasible manner. This is the enablement effect or the handprint. And a lot of emphasis is now on this, that yes, we, we help others, so that's enough. But it's definitely not enough. So the ICT sector's own, for example, energy consumption keeps increasing. It's not, not decreasing, it's not stabilizing, it keeps increasing. And the, that's energy is just one part. But other environmental burden, other social burden, the footprint part, we have to really pay attention to that. And luckily, at least the, the companies are into this now. The research community is, is doing this right now, but we're still far away from, from having the solutions. But one thing we need to do is that, that we have to have these both roles, not to explain away that our, our own help, helping others is enough so we don't need to do anything. We, we do need to act and we do need to define 
together the indicators and the measurement methods and the requirements for the solutions. For example, right now, when you, when in Europe, the European regulators were asked about the indicators of environmental sustainability for the ICT sector, what they're using. Most of them did not use anything. Some countries had some ICT-specific environmental sustainability indicators. So we really are, are, are in the starting point of this process. Next slide. Then key stakeholders, we all need to do something. Users want to know what the impact of their choices is. End users, when I talk to the young, younger generations, they want to know how much energy, how much greenhouse gases, gas emissions of the use of an ICT device and the ICT service creates. And the footprints are different depending on the device connectivity dimensions. So you have put these resources together and it's quite different depending on which, which resource combinations you use. But that information is not available. That's not, not, not for the end user to see. It's not for the regulators to see so that they could direct towards this development. And here the research community has a lot of Lot, lot to give as bringing the unbiased research results in the table. But for that, we need the data from the industry. We need this, this, this real, real life data. Next step. And the next step. Yes, so for 6G, ICT systems are a powerful measurement tool. They can provide a lot of data about environmental sustainability and social sustainability to solve major challenges. All the use resources need to be used as efficiently as possible by optimizing the locations of what is done where. Today, the, the world, like the leading countries in mobile communications are those that consume most data. And that's far from being sustainable. So we are leading something because we consume a lot. Well, that's not really sustainable. So we, are, we actually need to have a whole, whole new way of looking into what is a forerunner in terms of the ICT sector and mobile communications. So we have to minimize. In the future, we need to minimize the data we transfer, or at least minimize the impact, the environmental and social impact that that's, that transfer has. That is, is a diff quite a different design criteria for the future. And our sector is not the only sector dealing with sustainability challenges. A lot of methodological development, a lot of indicator development, key, key performance, key value indicator development hap happens in other sectors. And it's, it really requires a multidisciplinary approach and collaboration. Next slide. Then I have an example of spectrum management. It's, it's my own, own research topic. So what sustainability means there. And one thing, what it means there is through shared access of spectrum, you can gain access to spectrum, but it's not done today. It really, we have the unlicensed band. So if you come up with a major solution, wireless solutions, you can only use the unlicensed band. It's really hard to get, get, gain access to spectrum. For local networks, we're starting to get that now, but we need those sharing-based techniques and also technologies, but it's also a regulatory challenge. So we need to have those implemented in the regulations. Next. So to, to conclude, I want you to remember that 6 is not only about communication service, but it brings together different kinds of capabilities. And it brings pretty, pretty powerful platform, but it has to be optimized. So it cannot, if we just do as we did before, the consumption of, of energy will explode. If we just see the numbers of, of users increasing and data rates increasing. So we really have to do more efficient solutions. And business ecosystems change. Local 5G networks are already introducing local ecosystems around the different vertical use cases. And the same development will definitely continue. That will open new business opportunities for different kinds of companies to, to operate. And sustainability, that is a key Key driver. There are many values. Like in 6C R&D, we have like one values. Like com countries, we like-minded countries. They have shared values. Like like and sustainability one is one of them. And that is an umbrella term. I like to use that as the umbrella because under that we have a lot of things, co including the bridging the digital divide. And end users are forgotten usually in the process. The mobile network operators say that, yes, they bring the end user perspective into the game, but they're not really there. The developers aren't there. So the developers of the solutions and services, the applications, they aren't, they aren't there. It's still primarily dominated by the existing strong players, the infrastructure vendors, the operators who are there. 
So therefore, we need, we, it's time that we consider this whole ecosystem and the stakeholder process that who are the stakeholders in the 2030s? They may not be the ones that are to, strong today. How do we all include the new voices into this changing, changing ecosystem and business environment so that the end users are really, their voices are heard towards sustainable 60? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Maria-san. Okay, next one is Tony-san. Okay. Hey. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm Tony. So I'm um, a faculty in university, but uh, I'm also serving as a director of the Future Commerce Industries of Singapore's B5G program. I just want to share the perspective from a small country uh, we started thinking about this about 2019. Our whole purpose at the end is what does it mean for us as Singapore, the economic impact, the social impact, and national resilience. So I just want to share why particularly we look at Open RAN at around 2018. Next slide. Uh, as I mentioned, so the initial investment is about 50 million US dollar, about Singapore, uh, 68.7 million. Uh, the background was, uh, it's essentially we look at um, Connectivity is going to be a foundation layer for a lot of services. A lot of services beyond 5G, think about services that are important to Singapore because aviation is important, maritime is important. A lot of services will be connected. Uh, the geopolitical political situation is something that we have to be uh, keep in mind, especially Singapore is a neutral uh, position. So how would it affect in terms of key technologies? Uh, how would it mean to have an ecosystem in Singapore? Uh, Investment in leadership role so that we actually can play a part together with our like-minded uh, partners. So this is some investment that we started. Next slide. Uh, so I'll just keep this slide. So, um, so just for the background of some uh, audience, so particularly we look at uh, Open RAN because essentially, uh, as what uh, Ishizi Sang has mentioned, how do we bring in tier two, tier three player uh, into the ecosystem. A traditional RAN, if you break it out in the open RAN systems, it's the aggregation, there's multi-module open interfaces. That's where uh, a lot of emphasis on software as we decouple the software from hardware. This is where some opportunities will come in, especially for a player like Singapore. Next slide. Uh, there's few areas that uh, are, are potential research area. Uh, I'll just pick three. There are a lot more. The next slide. Uh, the first slide is on uh, security and trust, not just security only, but you need an infra that will be trustworthy. So some of the security risks we look at, uh, essentially every, uh, a lot of all these systems will be cloud native. How would cloud will be a, a essentially one security risk? How do we actually manage this? Uh, vendors, if you look at a lot of vendors, security may not be the high priority list. Uh, uh, performance, reliability will be there. How do you actually complement and help these vendors to actually uh, improve their capability on that. One of the issues with uh, Open RAN we, lead, we, uh, we see is the complexity, increasing of complexity, especially with multi-vendor. The capability of SI is going to be very important. How would, that, how would they play a role? How do we uh, automate some of this process? Uh, supply chain, especially in software, supply chain risk, different vendors coming in. Uh, it's good then Mary talk about shared spectrum, right? Essentially, once we do search across all these open platform system, what is the risk of the disruption of services? Uh, this is something that I uh, have to keep in mind building this capability. Um, we look at it as uh, how, how Singapore will use the role as neutrality, as neutral position to improve uh, security and trust in this ecosystem and contribute. So we play a role in Plugfest, uh, uh, ORAN Alliance, and uh, vendor adoption. Next slide. The next area we want to look at is actually one powerful uh, uh, capability of ORAN is this transparency that allow us to actually implement intelligence, right? AIML across a different controller, the services, the generation of this uh, data, how do you really trust the model, ALML for RAN sustainability. This will be the one of the key feature. Essentially, how do you actually test it? How do you actually verify this? How do you actually apply this across the different vertical services, the capability across this? This will be uh, implemented across the orchestration where uh, Shi Zhang has mentioned. How do you benchmark as we have all, a lot of all these uh, AI ML S apps across the different vendor? Is there a common benchmarking? Is there something that we mutually recognize? So this is something that we have a lot of opportunities for us to create vertical services uh, and, uh, and be needle moving. 
the next slide. Sustainability, as we have to think about the uh, infrastructure, uh, Singapore has really announced the carbon tax. We're going to roll out carbon tax and down the road uh, purely with some timeline. As we, imp as we implement, whether it's private network or public network, we really have to think about sustainability. How will all this infra, uh, even or open RAN, capture this sustainability where it's at RU side because RU consume a lot of power? How would all this sustainability, all the uh, different requirements, energy efficiency come into play? So this is where we have to plan way ahead, uh, work with the vendors. It's a very green field for everyone. So how do we make uh, be a leader, especially for Asia? I think Asia will have a particular role in sustainability as a service. So it's something we can leverage and work together. Next slide. So uh, we built up as as uh, uh, we. In the beginning, we'll say we need a test bed. Let's, let's build a test bed, uh, build around all this uh, research area, make, make sure it's open modular, with our, work with our partners, bring the ecosystem to Singapore. Uh, so these are the, some of the features we have, software-defined, reconfigurable. Next slide. So, uh, so we have this uh, first ORAN uh, network that's set up around 2021. Uh, once we sell, we think about what are the interesting use case we can uh, work with the vendors and build up capability. We go to the next slide. So one of the, uh, we can move to the next slide, it's fine. So, uh, we, so we essentially we started to build a drone arena. The reason why we net it up, because we are very close to the airport. For us, uh, our university is very, uh, it's within five kilometer from Changi Airport, so it's a no-fly zone. So the way we actually work with the government is that if we net it up, it's like the Jurong Bird Park if you've been to Singapore then the drone will not fly out. So they say you can actually fly. So this is where our site, we have a private 5G ORAN network. We can do a lot of uh, use cases, channel management, some of the companies you look at, you look at XR drone racing. So this is where some of the use cases that Metaverse could come in. How would 3D network essentially play a role in this uh, setup? It's a small test bed for us to look at. Next slide. Uh, the, because uh, we are looking at cyber physical uh, um, concept, so we are looking at as a as a campus. It could be a factory, but as a university, we have a campus. So we're thinking about how will in the future you incorporate the cyber and physical. Because COVID pandemic has has uh, forced us to really think about um, cyber world. How would the virtual campus, virtual uh, work experience change down the decade? How, how would connectivity change the way we work? So we were trying to understand, is there a new way of communication as we bring in all this uh, capability to the, uh, to the campus um, and also work with the uh, faculty and students trying to understand this um, extended AR, personalized learning. Then once we understand this and build a capability, uh, you can actually branch out to other sector. Next slide. Uh, Metaverse has, has been talked a lot, so we're thinking about what is the connectivity requires for this? Because Web3 is going to be a big uh, impact across the different services. Particularly Singapore, we actually have a, a very consensus there. How will it change the consumer market? How will it change the enterprise market? How will it change even the way different enterprise, different companies collaborate, transact, and communicate? Then how would connectivity play a role in this whole ball game? Uh, sensors coming in, so this is a uh, sort of a playground that we work with uh, uh, closely with the different partners, uh, whether it's a platform and also with the telco. Next slide. So some of the plans that we have currently with uh, setting up or explain setting up OTIC to do measurement, to do testing, uh, multi-vendor uh, network, uh, coordination of MM Wave 3.5. We have MM Wave band uh, located to the telco. Unfortunately, uh, telco have not deployed essentially. Trying to understand even the service model or is it possible to deploy an ORAN type of MM wave together with a conventional uh, network? This is something we work working with them. The use of digital twin. We're also trying to expand our test base to include NTN. NTN is going to be, make a big difference, a lot of uh, services and sector around ASEAN. So uh, it's something we are looking at and um, trial technology. Next slide. So one concept, uh, or let's just skip this, I mentioned about OTIC. We can skip this slide. Uh, I mentioned about this uh, ORAN, the relationship ORAN and NTN, because down the road, a lot of the satellite, especially from transparent type of a mode, uh, when they move to the regenerative sa satellite, one of the opportunities that regenerative satellite has opportunities to uh, apply concept of uh, ORAN, whether it's the CUDU is there or uh, different architecture. 
So once that comes in, there's uh, opportunities for even uh, ecosystems trying to do testing uh, around this uh, 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 sort of OTIC with NTN -end capability. So this is uh, what we wanted to do uh, to prepare for the next uh, phase uh, when NTN is going to be very big around particular Asia and ASEAN. Next slide. So uh, this is a concept that we wanted to push beyond the cyber physical campus is that we have invested so much since sustainability is a key. So how do we leverage our investment together with like-minded partners? So we had uh, first connection uh, with the 5G, 6G Innovation Center, University of Surrey. So we're looking at, with this, uh, of course, it's a VPN, at, um, VPN and, um, and also the academic network. How do we actually work on uh, sharing resources, sharing testing, sharing measurement, and also data? How do we actually apply some of this federated model? How do we think about uh, language, distributed language model? So this is something we are looking at. Uh, another thing we're exploring is industry-led. So industry lab may not necessarily always have to be co-located physically uh, with us. So how do we leverage on their lab and have uh, access or access remote access to it? And how do we explore the different models? So this is something we are working with, uh, uh, thinking about uh, other OTICs. That could be one different models. Uh, this is something we I think it makes sense because if we talk about sustainability, it's always good to for leverage on the different investments across uh, different countries and different uh, companies so that we have a common purpose and, uh, and, and to share. So this is what we want to pu push from a Singapore side. Next slide, I think, uh, and thank you. Thank you very much, Tony-san. Okay, thank you uh, for the panelists, panelists uh, for the, your uh, position talks. Okay, so uh, actually, uh, I have prepared some questions for the discussions. So, uh, could you show the <coughs> questions? Okay. Okay, so uh, I have came up with some discussion points and uh, I would like to start with these uh, questions. Uh, First, I maybe you have already mentioned uh, something about this, but uh, I would like to ask again about expectations to the uh, beyond 5G, 6G. So, what were expected changes to networking systems in the 2030s, where beyond 5G, 6G is fully utilized? What were expected changes? So, uh, I would like to maybe go sign some first. <laughs> sure. I get the easy question here. So um, it's, um, it's, it's artificial intelligence and machine learning, right? So that's sort of the, the low-hanging fruit. I think we're already starting to see uh, some of the emergence and the dependence or uh, kind of the forward integration of artificial intelligence moving from the compute side, uh, the large language models, et cetera, that's, uh, th that is happening, now moving into the network side, the transport, uh, as you'd call it, and then we're gonna see that more natively on the air interface side. Um, so from the spectrum sharing uh, thing that you heard was a common theme across all panelists, the idea that you have smart uh, software defined radios that have the intelligence already built in, you now have much finer grain resolution on how you could control the spectrum voxels that are available. So again, being a little bit technical, the physical resource blocks on the spectrum in the time and frequency domain how they could be shared, how they could be divided, and then how does the, uh, the radio interface sense and communicate on the same channel? Uh, and how are those policies and how is that uh, decentralized so you don't necessarily have a central authority? Obviously that adds a regulatory headache um, in terms of how, those, uh, uh, how these systems are first of all understood. Uh, so how is the AI explainable? And then how do you essentially make sure that these network systems are actually doing uh, what they are supposed to be doing? Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, who would you like to answer next? Okay, so uh, Tabisa-san. Thanks very much. Um, I think for, for me is something that I touched on a bit um, in, in, in my presentation. Um, I, I think the most important thing for us is around the interoperability, so the spectrum sharing, 
um, the ability to leverage the resources, expand the resources quite extensively, um, and ensure that um, the spectrum is not only just for those who can afford it, especially if you use a process such as the one South Africa did around um, auctioning. It's about the deepest pockets and therefore you um, inevitably just leave out the small players who actually bring the innovation, who bring the diversity in the market. So for, for, for us, um, the, the expectations that we expect to see in, in, in these networking systems is around the diversity in the market participation um, with, with the small players. And then um, the other point was around the localization of the, the data or the localization of the systems, the ability for the systems to, to be um, to address those the context in which it's working in. And that speaks to uh, you know having the access to the, the global um, knowledge system, but also being able to develop our own local knowledge systems um, in, in especially as the developing nations. Thanks. Very much. Okay, Maria san. combines the communication service with the other capabilities, sensing, locationing, imaging, computing, those come together in SIXI. That's, that's one of the changes that, that we are, are seeing that I was talking about. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll add just a perspective. So um, with all these technologies, I think at the end, we are, have to e convince our people, that means our government agencies, that it actually can generate social impact and economic impact. We have to ensure that with all these new technologies, networking technologies coming in, especially for Singapore, there are certain sectors we are still ahead. So, so this is important, uh, whether it's open platform or intelligence platform, how would actually um, change our position? How do we uh, be stay ahead? And how do we feel fully utilize all these uh, different technologies? So this is one of the key uh, basis of which technology or which investment we put in. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so uh, to summarize, uh, I get uh, your comments. Uh, so uh, by beyond 5G, 6G, uh, you are going to uh, have more uh, like uh, detailed advanced uh, management of the spectrum sharing, for example, by explainable AI, or uh, also uh, if we have more interoperables uh, scheme, uh, we can expect much more uh, proper market uh, and also uh, 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 maybe change the position of uh, business, this kind of thing. So uh, if you have some questions from the floor, please. Okay, so until waiting for the questions. Uh, okay, so to realize these things, uh, what do you think about the, for example, regulations? Maybe we need to think about regulations. And uh, yes, of course, regulation is necessary to be changed, but uh, how should we think about this? Uh, we need to change a lot, actually. So in my mind, it's very, really difficult compared with the things that we have done for this uh, 20, 30 years. Maybe we need a uh, very big change in the regulations. So what do you think about this? Maria-san, maybe first? The spectrum part is definitely one, and we already see the divergence there. Countries are assigning different bands for local 5G. It leads to fragmentation, because the whole mobile communication is based on using the same equipment globally. My phone works here, so that was the whole point of IMD systems. So the same should continue in the future, so we have to have harmonized. And it's a challenge because countries decide themselves how to do things. And it, the, the law, private networks operate under a different regulations than the public ones. The public networks have, to have a certain set of rules and, and, and that they have to follow, but they also have some kind of benefits that they then get from this status. And even this is very different in Finland, in, in Europe, in Asia, in US. So it's very, very complicated. And then the same pieces of equipment should work everywhere. So <laughs> I don't envy the role of the regulator. So maybe I pass the, the, the mic there. 
Um, I, I think you touched on a very important uh, aspect, Mari, which is um, around harmonization and, and, and being uh, very intentional around harmonization and standardization of, of, of equipment. So um, one thing that the developing nations, or at least in the African context, are good at is really participating in the international um, uh, debates and discussions. So the, the WRC, the, the PP that had uh, happened last year, the ITU Council, etc. However, um, anyone who's attended those sessions knows that um, it really is around the loudest voice in the room and the lobbying thereof. And so if we don't keep the development imperatives, um, the global development imperatives in mind, we then lose sight of what it is that, that, that we're trying to achieve. And therefore we get that, you know, the lack of interoperability, the, the lack of harmonization, et cetera, the fragmented spectrum use, et cetera. So that, I think that is very important in that, um, you know, impressing upon global regulatory bodies around the fact that we, you know, harmonization is important for sustainability and it's important for um, accessibility in terms of cost and inclusion. Um, the, the other aspect around the regulator's role and what you say you don't envy, which is now my daily job, <laughs> um, it, it really, I think for me, is around um, dismantling regulation as we've known it. Um, I, I, and once again, let me add the disclaimer that um, you added. These are my personal views and not the views of South Africa. <laughs> But I really believe that we need to dismantle regulation as we know it, because what we were previously, and some countries still are in, in the sub-Saharan region, regulating for has become obsolete. We cannot, we no longer talk about the, the typical regulatory tools that we used to have. Um, uh, you know, uh, what was it? Um, call termination and all those things. They don't matter anymore, because you know, we, we seeing that what regulators are starting to do is to become more digital and technical type of regulators. And the mandate is now more around research than it is around you know, regulating the sector. So they are setting the standard, they are setting the bar, they are the ones determining how things should be done. And so that's how I view um, the change in, in the regulator. And with that, it will bring the agility that's required to keep up. Thank you very much. Kosain-san, if you have some. Yeah, j just, uh, just to add, right, so you can, you can only regulate something that you understand, right? So first you have to have a baseline of what is, and when we talk about scary things like AI and generative AI right now, obviously it's, it's, it's sitting in a different domain, but it's gonna creep up into the networking domain as well. So how are decisions essentially made? So a regulator's job is sort of learning on the fly and learning as things go along. And that's why to tie this back to the panel discussion, uh, that's why the platform, a neutral uh, platform that has somewhat of a mirroring of what's happening out in the broader deployment uh, piece. So if you can't measure it, if you can't uh, understand what is actually going on, what the operators are, 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 are telling you, what are other private deployments doing, how is spectrum being used, how are networks being used, how is data being managed, how are things being firewall protected, et cetera. You, you, so I think you're, you're essentially just uh, uh, reacting if you're not in lockstep with where sort of the networks of the future are gonna be. Okay, so Tony-san, my image of Singapore is uh, you are very flexible about regulation, so what do you <laughs> no, think about that? Actually, um, Spectrum is a bit sensitive because we have neighbors, so anything goes to the neighbors is always not good. Uh, so, so I think the experience what we, we did uh, together with IMDA, which is equal FCC, to do this future comms is you try to look at whether it works. Work with and see whether you can build an ecosystem which you believe we convinced us. Then uh, slowly we bring in the telco. It took uh, us two years to get to convince the telco why not we try something? Because the telco says, I really locked down by the conventional by the vendor. Why should I try to explore? So I think the, the we see a new business model of this sandbox concept. That's what uh, Gosen has mentioned. A sandbox, but the sandbox needs to be realistic. 
cannot be too too academic. There needs to be industry academy, there needs to be vendor inside. Once you break that that ecosystem, then you actually can convince a policymaker to to change a bit and try. So this is uh, what we have been uh, trying to do. Likewise, uh, new technologies like NTN, we may not, something we really need to think about because same thing, with this spectrum, the neighbors, it propagates across so many people. What were the implications? So I think a sandbox is really uh, important as, as we want to try out. Then, of course, new business model could come in. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Or comments. Please. Uh, my name is Nori from Yamaguchi from NICT. I have two questions for your uh, panelists. Thank you very much for the, today's uh, very fruitful and uh, very informative uh, session. One question is uh, I'm wondering uh, everyone talk about the spectrum harmonization and uh, uh, Dr. Marimek Blue has uh, mentioned uh, some uh, difference of the uh, spectrum between uh, Finland and the Germany, so maybe harmonized. And also, uh, uh, Ms. Faye Mangi has uh, uh, mentioned that uh, some frag fragmentation of the spectrum, which might be some uh, disadvantage or some problem in the future. And the other, on the other hand, uh, Mr. Agostain has uh, mentioned that. Uh, this can be solved with, with, uh, with the development of technology. Then a software uh, technology might be, uh, can uh, uh, give there some, uh, uh, some integration of such a fragmentation of the uh, spectrum. And uh, so I'm wondering how they can uh, uh, solve this uh, spectrum harmonization all over the world. Yeah. So I, I, like to some uh, opinion, observation uh, of that. The second thing is uh, the number of standards in the 6G, because uh, we are now uh, standards of, uh, de uh, developing uh, uh, from the 1G to 2G, 3, 3G. In this time, we just have uh, a few uh, standards, but in the 4G and 5G, we have some several standards, because uh, oh, each uh, requirement has a, uh, you know, each country has uh, pr uh, pr uh, proposed different standards according to their requirement. That's why um, uh, there is a, they need some standards for the competition, uh, the uh, view of the competition. But the other hand, but we might need uh, not so many standards because of the mass production over for the, uh, uh, for the manufacturing point of view. So I'm wondering how many standards will be uh, required or uh, most uh, uh, ideal for the development of the 6G. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Who would like? Okay, Maria san I can start answering my view on both questions. The spectrum part is a challenge. We already now see when we're starting to talk about 6G spectrum, the views are so divergent. Europe already is saying something that Many countries don't want any spectrum for 6G, and that is the big, big challenge that we face in, in Europe, how to make convince that there is, is the need and then what those bands are. So it's, it's a debate which will happen in the coming years, and I, we all need to be willing to bring the facts on the table, not just opinion or, or, or wishes, but the pure facts that we know. So then I already jump to the next one, that the standards part, so 5G, 5G has mainly two standards. So there's the 3 GPP standards, which is the dominant one, and then there is the ETSIDECT standard, a smaller one where smaller players came together in, in the European Telecom Standards Institute and proposed it to the ITU process, and it was approved there. Also other proposals have been rec were received to the global ITU process. So those two exist. They, they say that both, both networks are, are being sold, but we know main, mainly the three GPP. That's where the big players are. That's where the big companies mm -hmm. are. They, they create those standards, and they, the IP games are played in that standards arena. Those players who are within three GPP, they say that they want one, just one 60 standard, which is their, their, their three GPP standard. Nothing stops other organizations or standards but it's to propose 60 standards to the ITR process once the requirements are defined. One that is, and personally I, I, 
I would, I, I think there might be more proposals just that one. In 5G, there were several proposals. In 3G, there were several accepted proposals. So one definitely will be, but that one should not stop others. There's room for, for many kind of deployments. Thank you very much. Who would like to answer more? Okay. Sure, so on the spectrum side, basically, I think, uh, <clears throat> well, like it or not, WRC that's coming up in a month, month and a half, each member state, each country is going in with a position that's been defined. So there will be some harmonization, there will be some agreement. Um, and again, as you know, the WRC cycle that will go out uh, the next four years or the next eight years, that agenda will also be set in November. So unfortunately, that's the, the, the spectrum story has to be very carefully constructed. Uh, I think with 6G, you're seeing the in entrance of uh, new players like the SATCOM, uh, the NTN, the non-terrestrial networks, they'll be included uh, in there. Uh, so how do you sort of harmonize it now at, when you add a third dimension? So not just terrestrial, but non-terrestrial elements on the spectrum piece as well. So yeah, not, not, not necessarily painting a very rosy picture on the spectrum front because that is such, uh, needs to be very carefully coordinated. On the standards front, I think, uh, yeah, as, as, as Maria sort of very nicely sort of pointed out, there is the 3GPP dominance. And I think, you know, there is this, there has been this debate about whether 6G will be an evolution or a revolution, right? So the 3GPP standard will continue to be an evolution. That's a juggernaut. It is, um, again, as you know, she alluded to on the IP side, you know, the game is all about SEPs, the standard essential patents. And that's where a huge amount of, uh, you know, economic activity is generated. So that part is not going to stop. That behemoth is going to go. The release cycle, so right now in the 3GPP realm, we are at release, uh, uh, you know, 17 was approved in June earlier this year. 18, 19 study items have been defined, and the 3GPP cycle says that, you know, somewhere around the release, uh, uh, you know, 21 time frame, you're going to come up with the moniker 6G. Right now in 3GPP, we're already past 5G. We are in 5G advanced. Uh, so we're already moving. But the, the other part uh, uh, is standards are also, if you really dissect a network, there are lots of different standardization bodies. There is IETF that talks about the tra transport piece. There are entities um, that, that I ISO that talks about security. Then there's 3GPP. So you have to be very careful around how all of that is stacked. Uh, uh, but if you just look at the wireless comms, the wireless uh, communication side, yes, there are uh, member states and different countries that have already made uh, their commitments and announcements. They've all developed their own public-private partnerships, their alliances that are promoting what standard it has to be. And there has always been this struggle between the, 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 the developing or uh, world where the cost of the devices is the key issue. And that is the key issue for adoption, because if there is a, a device cost that has a component or a chipset where you need to pay a royalty of hundreds of dollars, that drives up the device cost, and that's going to drive down or slow the adoption. So that is a key element that you know the developing uh, world has to uh, really think. And I think that's one of the motivating factors outside of lots of other factors, terrain, uh, population density, et cetera, et cetera, that need to be considered as well. OK, thank you very much. Look, I need to think about the time, actually. So <laughs> may I move on to the next one? OK, so I'm talking, uh, I would, would like to discuss business issue. So what is the new business model or ecosystem to be created by Beyond 5G, 6G? Uh, what type of disruptive progress is expected uh, in the future business, along with the shift to Beyond 5G, 6G? So if you have any uh, opinion, Maria san, I think I you have. I have opinions. <laughs> they are my personal opinions. <laughs> <clears throat> but w w there are many types of businesses to consider here. One is the mobile communications connectivity business, what the mobile network operators offer. So that's one part of the p game. Another part is then the ecosystems that emerge around the different us usages of the networks, like the local networks, harbor areas, hospitals and so on. So those will have their own ecosystems. And then the business model, business model is the logic that what is the value offering, what is the, who get, who, what, what is being offered, who buys it. And it now 
is shifting from a company level to the ecosystem level. So we are starting to think about ecosystem level business models. So what for this use, this kind of usage, what, who are the stakeholders there who need to be in place? One company, it rarely involves just one organization, but multiple organizations. And they all need to get something for that. It should not be based on one, like the winner takes it all, but it's, there should be some kind of balanced role that they all can support their, their businesses. The, going back to this mobile connectivity business, we, we've, see, we've seen changes in terms of, the, for example, the number of operators per country. Most countries started with one operator, the governmental operator, then gradually making that the liberalization, introducing the second one, and then the third one, and so on. And it went to the point that in many, especially European countries, there were like five, six operators. And there, was, they, there were auctions, the treaty brought the spectrum auctions, crazy amounts of money were bid on, on spectrum. And it led to a lot of, uh, like many operators suffering, and then they started buying each other. So the third and fourth merged in the list. So that happened. So now there's less, smaller number of MNOs in each country than there was in, in, the, in the hype time. They continue, like now, now they're quite well established. They claim they don't have, have money. Well, some of them don't have, but in Finland, they all make a good revenue. They could make good profit. Well, they haven't paid much for the spectrum that has helped them, but anyway, they, they've made good money. So that business continues. They still have licenses for long future to come. So that business is there. What the, what the revenues are in the future, they still get that money, monthly subscriptions. 5G is still based on monthly subscription fees as 4G was, as 3G was. So it's the same building model still are there. So this continues to, to continue, at least for the, for the future, and they, that, that continues. Then what 6G comes, brings as a new thing for the business, that is un unknown. That's, that's, that's the unknown part, where we need to look into what, what kind of new business is, could come. But one thing is that they will emerge around those different usages, and then who pays for what, for what, you get connectivity for free, so you not necessarily pay for that so much, but still, if you get something, extra, something great with that, you do pay for that, in addition to the service subscriptions that, that you have. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, okay, so you have. Um, I think what we've started seeing with 5G in, in South Africa is um, seeing uh, uh, the use or the monetization of what we would term in universal access and service the true access gap. So seeing uh, small, uh, medium enterprises starting to start to get some economic value out of that true access gap. And the way that they've done that is by tapping into the network, but also leveraging the obligations that came with the Spectrum auction. Um, so we're starting to see new business models where um, networks are, um, the, the, the base stations are set up in schools. So we are addressing those um, uh, development imperatives, but then the networks serve the greater community. And really the models are not to make um, the obscene profits that we see in, in bigger companies, um, but rather to be able to sustain the development of another um, similar uh, Wi-Fi project. So we, we've started to see that, and South Africa in particular, and I, I think another um, nation that has a similar topography is, is um, Rwanda, but we have a vast amount of space to cover and really high mountains and low valleys. And so um, having to you know, get to coverages, and then we have a lot of rural spaces, so um, where there isn't a lot of economic participation. So covering that becomes extremely expensive. And these community networks have really bridged that gap, and they're slowly changing what we understood to be the business model in the sector. Um, and, and really coming in with, with um, economic participation in what we can, I don't think we can for much longer call a true access gap anymore. Um, so maybe we um, share one of the, what we are trying to do. So we're trying to um, change the mindset of the telco. So we're trying to tell them that the subscription model is not, not going to work down the decade because with all this infra is going to be more expensive. So. The process we are trying to force them, uh, open platform, open RAN on it, is force them to build the capability of uh, S-Line, uh, like, for example, what Docomo is trying to do, so that eventually the market has to be outside Asia, outside Singapore. In particular, we're looking at uh, Indonesia, which is so close to us. Uh, Indonesia is one market. 
uh, Thailand, Vietnam. So, so we hope that this, uh, this could build a new business model for them so that they will start to think out as an SI. Uh, so this is probably a new business model, but it's always very difficult to change the telco because they are so used to get <laughs> subscription. So this is some, some, something that we are trying to do from a government perspective and agents uh, and, and national program. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, actually, I have also questions, but uh, it's better to go next. <laughs> okay, now number three, collaborations. Uh, what are key items for international collaborations to realize the Beyond 5G 6 c as open platform, open service platform? What will be the international collaboration? If you have any questions, comments? Yeah, so um, again, I think, I, you know, uh, first things first for, uh, international collaboration, you, you, you need a champion, you need a public-private partnership or a key stakeholder that actually is going to be representative or present somewhat of a unified opinion or a unified viewpoint. So after you've had a kind of a national position, then you're able to sort of communicate. And the, the other thing is it, uh, communication has to happen between government to government, industry to industry, and then at the research level between uh, academics and researchers. Obviously, at the government level, it is very sensitive, joint ministerial statements, et cetera, um, different politics are at play. So the idea is, at least at this formative stage, when the next generation is still about eight, 10 years down the line, you do want industry academia uh, to, to, uh, to, to, to jump ahead. And we are already seeing that in the marketplace, right? So in the US, you already have the Next G Alliance, where a large number of um, major vendors and operators are at play. Um, we, we have, you know, lots of different alliances, uh, including here in Japan, uh, the Beyond 5G Promotion Consortia, which is mobile network operators and vendors that have gotten together. Same in Korea, Bharat 6G in India, um, uh, South America sort of catching up, Singapore, etc. So we, we're seeing that as kind of the, the first piece. But then at the, at the real collaboration level, unless we have mobility and unless we have uh, the ability to sort of get a peek into where the core competencies lie for each region. And we have our strengths, right? So everybody plays to their strengths, but the idea is how do you do this in a complementary fashion so that you have the ability to sort of learn from the best and the sum is greater than the sum of its parts, right? So one plus one is greater than two. And that's sort of why we are even talking about collaboration in the first place. Thank you very much. Any other comments? I agree with, with Gosen. So at the national level, there's always this initiative at top and bottom. So our approach is actually there's two way. There's of, of course the academia, uh, the, the professors and universities which want to do a research which is a very long term strategy. Uh, at, at the same time, we are trying to also focus on uh, short terms in a sense that we have targets like uh, platforms like uh, uh, MWC, like key, key events that we can actually show uh, impact together uh, to showcase some capability and, and, uh, and, and this is something we are trying to do together uh, with, with partners. Uh, what we worry, uh, especially if, uh, if we focus too much on um, the, the research part, uh, sometimes the translation uh, takes uh, a bit long and uh, some government stakeholder may be quite impatient. So, so we try to... Um, have uh, a balance between them. But at the end, I think it goes back to uh, the partners needs to have a common uh, goal that co complementary. It's all about collaboration so that one plus one is equal to three. Uh, if you have this mindset, then I think it's, uh, it's always good because it's more sustainable than to work alone. And as, as was mentioned, this collaboration is very different depending on the level of collaboration or the stakeholders or the government's collaboration is different from the researcher level collaboration. The key thing that is first needed is the funding for the research. And the research is done both in the academic side but also in the industry. And now I think we're in a pretty good situation in that sense that many countries have programs for this. The European Union has a program for this. And many, many countries have their own, own ones. And then there are these like-minded like, uh, like countries are already making st joint statements about, about this, like the EU and the US Trade and Technology Council has made this 6G outlook in Blue Leo in May this year. It defines the key principles 
And now that they are out there, it's then the role of the researchers and the industry to take those principles. And I've seen very little discussion on how these are then adopted into the work that we actually do. And this is the missing link. There was no such thing in 5G. That was not there. It is there in 6G. So now the community needs to take these principles, like sustainability, like inclusiveness and, and trust. They have to be translated into the work that we do now. It's a new thing, and it requires a change of mindset from, from the community to really respect what the higher level governments agree on and then do that in the research. And that's, that's the challenge that I, w I want to bring up. Thank you very much. Any further comments? Or any questions from the floor? No? Okay, looks like gradually we need to close the session. Okay, so uh, we'd like to have short message from you to the final message actually. Uh, from each of the panelists, uh, uh, so uh, who would like to give first the last message from you regarding this uh, topic, uh, the open service platform in beyond 5G, 6G era? Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay, I can go first. Uh, I think I uh, thank you for the organizer NICT for inviting us. I think. Uh, we have atten I personally have attended a lot of these uh, panels and all these workshop, but I hope that uh, you sh that um, there is outcome after this. We hope that eventually, uh, through this, we can have uh, different um, stakeholder on continent and um, have some eventual outcome down the road. That we because of this event today, we achieve something. This is what I hope that uh, we can when do. Then there's something. Uh, can bring bring back good memories. I hope this is my last message. Thank you. Thank you, Maria San. Yeah, then I'll continue with this this roles of the stakeholders, understanding what we are here for. I come from the academic research community. I'm here to help the people. So who are the users of the 16 networks? What do they really want? We have to ask. They, we don't. We can't ask them directly what they want because it's not the way, <laughs> the way it goes. But we have to be honest and take their perspectives into account. We saw in Europe, on in 5G, that the uh, consumers were disappointed in terms of what they were promised. Like oversized promises were made. Then what they were offered by the operators was pretty much similar things. And in, as in 4G, contracts were the same. Data rates were not. Not, not higher than in, five, in 4G when it was launched. So we cannot do this again. Social scientists say that this has already changed the end users' perspectives. They are, they, we can't do this again because they expect. So we cannot make oversized promises anymore. We, cannot, we can't do them for 5G. We cannot do them for 6G. So we have to stop talking about it will be a huge data rate or so on. If it's, we can't deliver that. So we have to now come back to this. The, the time for this over, oversized promises is over, but now we have to we seriously think what, what the future would look like and what is the fu desired future that the people, people really want. I'll, I'll, I'll continue with the theme, just put it in my own words. So the mentality of build it and they'll come is uh, not something that has served us uh, you know, well. As you see, we're still searching for the killer app for uh, you know, for 5G uh, to sort of make it or, or to justify it, but we're still all we already on the journey to 6G. But uh, I guess the key piece is, again, right, the platform model, what that allows you is to connect two disparate groups who otherwise would not engage. That's sort of what, if you really look at, that's what the platform, uh, you know, model is, 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 is planning to do, and that's what we sort of believe in, that's why we're here, that's why sort of, you know, uh, NICT is, uh, is also trying to play a role in that piece, is connecting these disparate uh, stakeholders who, who haven't been at the, at the forefront. So um, my sort of key takeaway is two C words, co-development and collaboration. And I think co-development, again, a little bit more technical, you know, not just cross-layer optimization, for example, that's a very, you know, technical concept, but essentially we're looking at different layers and different stakeholders and then sort of bringing them all uh, to the table at the formative stage and not necessarily, you know, when, when the decisions have been made, when the standards have been made, but the spectrum has been allocated, we're not going to serve anybody uh, well. And again, we, also, we have to think as citizens as well. 
Uh, thank you very much. I think without repeating <laughs> what has already been said, um, I, I think my um, parting words would really be about not forgetting the developing South. Um, bring them along on the journey. One of the biggest things that, um, you know, if you ever hear the resistance from the developing South about 6G, it's mainly around the energy um, impact. I think if we are moving into 6G without solving for the energy sustainability and, and the energy demands that come with it, then for, for us, it really is 5G plus. Um, there, there really is no difference. Um, so let's solve for the sustainability. Let's bring the developing South along because they unlock great, great potential. Um, and when, when they participate, it elevates the, the whole notion of what we're trying to do. Um, so we, we cannot leave behind that many people. Um, and, and the other thing is around collaboration. Um, it's so important that we um, allow the developing South to leverage the progress that's been made by other countries. So having more sessions like this, having visiting tours, having benchmarking um, tours and so on, that is what shapes the, the, the policy and the regulation of these developing nations. Then the catching up is very little. It's, it's, it becomes just the fundamentals of, of, of um, infrastructure. And, but when you have the right mi mindset, you're then able to have the people um, to influence the policy and drive the regulatory direction. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, okay, I need to conclude. Uh, okay, thank you very much for your uh, uh, information and opinion and uh, answer. Uh, actually, I personally believe uh, this topic is very, very important for the future, so I'm really happy to share this opinion today. So, okay, so uh, uh, fortunately we have actually uh, some years until 2030s, <laughs> but still, or, but or, already we have only uh, six years, so uh, we have to seriously think about this. So uh, I would like to uh, continue this discussion uh, with other stakeholders. So uh, uh, let's keep in touch. Thank you very much. Okay, now time, it's time to return my microphone to Hosako-san. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for the uh, fruitful discussion. Uh, I think that uh, already Isidu-san summarized uh, our discussion today, but uh, I firstly would like to thank to the, all the panelists come to here and have a very interesting uh, presentation. And uh, after that, uh, they are uh, talking uh, very interesting uh, opinions. But uh, uh, there are many, many uh, uh, kind of different kind of uh, uh, perspectives from the different nations and the different areas and the different positions. But uh, it, it is quite useful to recognize we have uh, such kind of differences each other. But uh, as already everyone mentioned that, we have a chance to recognize and a chance to have a collaborative, collaborative research together for the future uh, network and also uh, we would like to continue to collaborating uh, each other. So uh, this is the uh, starting point for the future collaboration today and uh, we would like to keep in touch with uh, in the future. Thank you very much for your uh, attendance and uh, presentations and also uh, collaborations together. Thank you very much. I'd like to close this session and thank you everyone. Thank you very much.